All right, well, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you for coming in. Uh, I've heard your name. I've seen your name scattered around in the New Zealand crypto scene for a while now. And uh, last year at that event, I had a chance to finally meet you. So thanks for agreeing to come come down. Can you just give us a quick uh, background? Uh, for example, how did you get into crypto or Bitcoin or whatever it is yeah. that, that you're into? Okay, cool. Yeah, so I used to be a banker uh, back in. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, that's, oh, my God, that's the worst. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I used to work for the, well, the CBA group, which is like the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. Uh, essentially the parent of uh, ASB, yep. ASB Bank here in New Zealand. Um, and um, I was in the quantitative um, risk risk department over there. So I'm a quant modeler by, by trade. A quant modeler by trade. I mean, <laughs> I think I know what that means, but I don't. It's okay. You don't have to go into it. <laughs> and uh, as part of like some of the initiatives that I was doing back in 2016 with the bank, um, they started doing three things at that point in time, which was, so one of, one of it actually had discovered Ethereum and what it was actually this thing, new network with programmability of smart contracts and what it was going to do for them. Um, and they wanted to explore that for issuance of, um, debt securities or all of a sudden we're talking about the same stuff that we're talking right now. Yeah, with so 2016 so, era? Yeah, 2016. Okay. Yeah, and um, so a kind of very first generation of STOs, if you will. Um, and, um, and at that point in time, so they did a project with the World Bank to issue the first private Ethereum node issuance of a bond on the blockchain with the World Bank. And I got involved in that project in that stage. And so like, whoa, this is interesting. And then um, there were a couple of other initiatives that actually started at that point in time. One of them was around things that we're still talking about today, like open banking. Yeah. Oh, oh that's... let's open the, the banks books and let's leave uh... all of these payment startups interact with the banks. Is it still not a reality? No, it seems, <laughs> it seems like a utopia. Oh, open it, banking. It's taking forever, right? Oh, in a lot of jurisdictions that has been regulated on banks in New Zealand, that has always been that kind of... Uh, we're going to do it, but let us do it uh, in our own time. And 10 years later, we're still not there. Right? Yeah. So, but anyways, with the open banking, and then I, like, I started actually putting the two things together. I was working this innovation project on open banking at, at that point in time. It was just at the beginning in the local environment. Um, and, um, and I said like, whoa, hold on a second. By the time this programmable technology here starts to actually to really be adopted, the open banking dream is going to be obsolete completely. So I'd rather actually focus on this thing here that is about, you know, building, in my view, and it is still the main use case, financial market infrastructure in a programmable, real-time, all-the-time way, rather than this other dream here that requires all of these intermediaries to essentially agree with each other actually to open their books and, and their, you know, and their APIs for the payments industry. I mean, that's an interesting point there because you're right. They kind of ran in parallel there. Did open banking had a bit of a lead actually, didn't it? Yeah, it did for quite a few years. Like, I mean, it's, we probably, like, I think some of the earliest initiatives in the open banking started being talking about in the UK back in, I think, 2014 or okay. something like that. So it's been already 10 years and that's clearly not, I guess, a reality across the globe there are some jurisdictions that are way more advanced in terms of what is it that the banking industry has done a commercial banking perspective but um but a lot of them actually haven't so anyways coming back to the thread yeah um so with that there's another project actually came around was already self-sovereign identity again we're talking about some themes that come as words yeah spiral, is, is, is again and uh where i worked if um yeah paul salesbury and and a few other people yeah paul's there. been on on the pod yeah he's, he's a very unique guy yeah and yeah. then we when we kind of like started actually you know collaborating at that point in time i said like you know what i'm i'm gonna jump off the chasm out of the cushy job in banking and i'm gonna actually you know follow the road along with these engineers at that point in time i was also like following you know 
you know, meetups that was just like a bunch of devs doing stuff. Janine was there as well, you know, yeah. like Easy Crypto was still it's in early kind of like ideation stages and um and elsewhere. And then actually I went on and worked for actually for Blockchain Labs, which was the previous company that Paul um right. was um was doing at that point in time. And it was all low level engineering things, mostly kind of like a smart contract at the base level. There wasn't a lot of like the infrastructure that we that we see today. Right, they were doing like auditing smart contracts. Well, that sort it was of thing. it was a bit of both. So there was actually there was a part of it that was actually about auditing uh, companies um, and the smart contracts. So some of the names that we worked with at the point in time, there was like Shapeshift, who was actually a big player back in that kind of 2017 kind of like round. The Voorhees, he's one of he's yeah. one of my faves. Yeah, yeah so. he's. he's He's great. Yeah, so Shapeshift was a, was one of those, and then there was a few also projects um, that have become more scalable over time post that ICO kind of like boom and crash. And um, and one of them, of course, Shapeshift. There was some of them that actually had a very big promise, but actually they didn't necessarily realize over time. T zero, which was actually also that first generation of STOs that were actually building, you know. T zero as in settlement, yeah, immediate. So, yeah, so T zero was about um, building infrastructure for real world assets on chain. Yeah, and um, and there was a lot of hype at that point in time. Again, that first generation of STOs, etc. And T zero was one of the leaders, along with Polymath and others, which were all related parties actually to the blockchain lab ecosystem. So it was interesting, you know, like it was it's a lot always of stuff. interesting. Yeah. 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 So all of that stuff that we, you know, people that we were working together, either in a uh, auditing capacity or auditing and advisory, sometimes actually things actually mixed. And um, within Blockchain Labs also did a little bit of uh, infrastructure work. For example, atomic swaps between different blockchains, which wasn't something that we didn't have a multi-chain world at that point in time right? <laughs> so we were doing some of the earliest kind of there were a few changes yeah, yeah but they were changes yeah. i mean change are still chains are still kind of islands i find yeah but we like to imagine yeah that's right yeah and there, there wasn't there weren't bridges there weren't any like the poa network all that kind of stuff that didn't exist right we were doing things at the edge um, you know, and sometimes, yeah, sometimes building, sometimes actually advising or auditing uh, companies. And anyways, came those two things together, my risk quant uh, background and the, actually the low level engineering stuff uh, in around, yeah, 2018, 2019, I, I started kind of like asking myself, okay, what's next, right? You know, like I, it's, it's really solid what we're we doing here, but at yeah. the same time we were at that point in time, it was like, treasuries that had been kind of like really raised through the ICO days, uh, through the ICO days, they hadn't been managed properly. This was uh, by a lot of projects. Like you say, a right? This, this is contributed to the boom bust. Boom um, bust. It's significant. Like some projects actually raised a lot of money, like 150 million. I mean, if you put that in, in context, the Ethereum ICO raised 15 million in regard. Look at what they are right now. Right? right. And some of projects that were like 10x in terms of raise, actually, some of them don't exist anymore. Right. How can you manage your treasury so badly, right? It's, I mean, you, you've got to ask yourself, right? So, I'm reminded of like earlier this year with like <laughs> AI companies that are just yeah. uh, repackaging chat GPT. And, and yeah. And, and to, to, your, to your point, right, companies were coming up with an idea and a token yeah. and launching it on Ethereum. But like you say, Ethereum itself, you know, raised a fraction of a the fraction money. A fraction of the money of a lot of those companies kind of like raised and contributed so much more than actually a lot of them actually did. Um, eventually, we don't know the end of the story because that story is still in building. But long story short, what it means is that then some of the kind of like those ICO treasuries is starting actually drying out because that wasn't actually managed or, or a lot of that it was actually through the tokens that were held in treasury rather than stable coins or whatever that they could manage a little bit more properly. Um, and um, and at that point in time, but all of that kind of like white paper, kind of like bloodbath and you say, what, what is the, what is tangible here out of all of this? 
And I started looking around and actually there were just a handful of projects at that point in time that were actually really coming out of the paper into something. One of them was MakerDAO. Another one was...